Blog Talk Radio. Uh, my father wasn't quite sure on how I was going to take care of myself as an artist, 
But when I transferred over from art to photography, he fully understood how a photographer could make money, so he was then happy. So, uh, but yeah, I love growing up with my parents. They were very I understand supportive. that your, your father had a really interesting job. Can you tell the audience uh, a little bit about what he did for a living? Oh, well, um, when he came to Los Angeles, he was looking for work. And he started out, he had a, he was delivering pharmaceuticals for, it's now the Samsung building. It's on the corner of Wilshire and uh, uh, La Brea. Uh, and then he got a job. He, he delivered some pharmaceuticals to Universal. Universal was in desperate need to hire some uh, African Americans, were black folks back then. Actually, I think we we're still Negroes, so that was like 60. Uh, and they needed some black folks to work in the back lot. There were nobody. There was no blacks working in the back back lot of Universal Studio in like 1959, 60. So they hired my father as a janitor, a maintenance man. But because of that union would not accept him being black, my father was hired uh, as a member of the Screen Actors Guild. So he had a Screen Actors Guild card to be a janitor in the back lot of Universal Studios where he worked uh, until throughout, throughout the 60s. That's, that's, uh, he, eventually moved, he eventually moved up to the props department at Universal before yeah. he left. Do you have any memories of what it was like on that lot? I think uh, you told me once before that you, uh, you went to the lot, right? Well, for about four years, we sort of lived on the Universal lot <laughs> during the middle of the 60s because my mother uh, worked uh, as a domestic cleaning home, and my dad worked at Universal, so, and there was, no, there was no such thing as daycare back then. So, uh, and we didn't have a lot of family. So my father would take me and my two brothers to Universal with him to work, and we would sit on the back lot. <laughs> and everybody would take care of us while he was working, and that went on for about four or five years. And, uh, and we would go to Universal, they used to have these uh, – Every Christmas or holiday, they'd have these events where all of the children of the employees would come. And, of course, we'd be, like, the only black kids there. And uh, just me and my brother, they give gifts and stuff out, and you get to hear rock music. And we heard, like, Herman's Hermits and Beatles and all kinds of groups like that would come and perform live because these were the children of the executives of Universal. And because my dad was, like, for a while the only black on the back lot, we sort of were a little specialer than everybody else. Uh, so it was really cool. I really liked it when he advanced from janitor to uh, the props department uh, because he would do things like he worked on the set of the television show, The Monsters, and uh, him and a friend one night sneaked the car out from Universal, the Monster Mobile, and brought it to Compton and got us up like 3 in the morning and said, hey, so y'all get a chance to see it. And he was a monster. It was one of those re really special things that happened. Yeah, there you was know. a photo of that in, in your last exhibit. Oh, yeah, it was a photograph that was taken by a friend of his of him sitting on the front bumper of the Monster Mobile. And, uh, yeah, and when I did the exhibition uh, at the WLCAC last year uh, about my early work in documentary, I included that because I, it was a series of photographs on my father's funeral. But I also wanted to show images of what he was like alive. So that was one of the photographs that was in the exhibition. Um, what was it like growing up in Compton, California? Um, we have our ideas of Compton nowadays, but what was it like as a kid growing up in Compton, coming from Detroit to Compton? Well, Compton, well, Compton went through a big change because when we got to Compton, it was there was more black families just starting to move in. Compton was considered uh, an advanced area for folks to live in at the time, so uh, we moved in. It was still a lot of white families there. Uh, of course, then after 1965, which was the revolt that happened in uh, in Watts, which is the adjoining community to Compton, uh, you had what was called white flight, which means a lot of white folks just disappeared. By the end of the year, there there was hardly any white people in Compton. Uh, so uh, then it changed, and it became predominantly black. Uh, and of course, I went to school there. And then when I was in high school, is when uh, the gang situation started to arise, and the community started to change as uh, politicians discontinued, uh, for example, uh, after-school sports. Uh, I remember sitting in the gym with all the other students, so we didn't have gym teachers because they had cut, the school district had cut funding for uh, sports and after-school programs. So you had all these young people with all this energy doing absolutely nothing, and that was right in the middle 
uh, when the gang situation occurred, and uh, uh, which caused the city of Compton to change a lot and go into the situation where it became really gang infested for a long time. And it's starting to improve. There's still a lot of problems, but it's starting to improve. I didn't have any problems, though, uh, as, as growing up in Compton. I enjoyed growing up in Compton. I, I mean, uh, I hated going to school, but then most kids do. Uh, but I lucked up when I was in uh, high school. Uh, I was became an artist when I was a young child. My mother used to help me learn how to draw and teach me how to draw. And uh, when I got to high school, my dad was afraid that I had ran off for about a year. <laughs> And if my dad sort of decided he was going to, he had to do something to give me something to motivate me, and he knew I liked to draw and paint. So he introduced me to uh, Wesley Hall, who was an artist, John Otterbridge, and uh, Ulysses Williams, who then ran the community services department at Compton College. And all together, they gave me a job and helped motivate me to where I am today. All right. Now, uh, the Compton Communicative Arts Academy, um, for our listeners, uh, can you... Uh Tell us what that was and your involvement with it, and what year, too. Uh, the Communicative Arts Academy was a group of artists. It was started by Justin Powell and John Outerbridge, and Justin went and hustled the money, and John ran all the arts programs. Both of them are artists. And, and it was a great place in the city of Compton where artists could come together. There were dance groups, uh, theater groups. Uh, they had music for bands, of course, drawing and painting, photography. Uh, it was just a great not nonprofit individual organization of artists. And, and they would just come and talk and do their work, and there were art courses that were taught. About and what happened was, hmm? About how old were you when you... Oh, when I first went to Community Arts Academy, I would think I was about 15. Oh, okay. 15 or 16, no, about 16 years old, 16, going on 17. And uh, my dad introduced me to John Otterbridge, who offered me a, a part-time job during the summer. And, uh, and that was 73. And I walked in, and they hired me to do minor things around. And I walked into a class that was being taught by Elliot Pinckney. And I showed Elliot my portfolio. He said, oh, wow, this is really nice. And he said, you know, uh, I need somebody to sit in for my class. Uh, the next week, and I said, okay. So I came in, I sat in for the class, and then Elliot never came back. So that's how I wound up teaching, <laughs> drawing, and painting at the Community Arts Academy. It was like, okay. And then I was, then I became the teacher. So uh, through my last two years of high school, I taught art at the Community Arts Academy. Uh, but it was really a great experience. It was just so many artists that came through, and uh, I'm just very lucky that my father hooked me up with that. And I got to meet John and bug him, and uh, it went on from there. And John hasn't been able to get rid of me since, so. I mean, John's been stuck with me since 1973, John Otterbridge. Um, who were some of the artists and instructors and other talented people that came out of uh, the academy? Uh, give us an idea of uh, who uh, the people. Oh, wow. Let me see. There's so many I know it's folks. a long list. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, let me see. Poets like uh, Kamal Daoud, Eric Priestley. Uh, oh, shoot. Uh, Cedric Adams. Uh, Harvey Estrada, who's a professor of music at Compton College. Uh, man, there's just so many folks. Uh, James Higgins, who was a great artist. Uh, I met people, like I said, Elliot Pinckney, who was one of the great murals of uh, Los Angeles. Uh, I met Cecil Ferguson and Marion Ferguson at uh, the Community of Arts Academy. Uh, uh, Timothy Washington, Greg Pitt, uh, Mark Greenfield. Uh, <laughs> it can just go on and on. There's just so many. When well, all this sculptures, Charles Dixon, I met him also there. What happened to it, the place? Uh, uh it you know, uh, it was hard it it was a great idea, but it's one of the things we have a problem with our community is supporting cultural events. It's like when there's a funding situation problem that occurs, there's a tendency of of cutting out funding for programs. It was an independent program. The city of Thompson loved it. 
but they wouldn't support it, so it was hard finding funding for it. Uh, John Otterbridge left in 75, 76, and went to become director of the Watchtowers Art Center. And then, and, and so they ran out of funds and they closed down, I think around 77, closed. But they've been going for a good 10, almost 12 years before that. Um, and then so everybody sort of moved over to the Watchtowers Art Center where John was, you know, so. During this time you were you were in high school. Um, uh, yes. Mm-hmm. I was going to Common High School. I graduated Common High School in 1975. Um, what was your high school experience like? Oh, my high school experience? Uh, Common High School, it went through a transition because it went from being a, before there was non-gang violence, and then there became gang violence, which changed a lot of situations of the school. A lot of things, uh, forces from the outside wound up coming into the school. My experience there was different, I guess, most because I was like the artist on campus. Uh, I took, I went to the art class. We had a really great advanced art program at Compton High School, which was like the first two periods of the morning, were just for these really the best artists in uh, in the high school could take this two-hour course in the morning. And we were just outstanding artists. We got to paint. We got to draw. Uh, so that was really great. I took a lot of high school, a lot of college courses, art courses, at night. Uh, I met Wes Hall, who was one of the art instructors there, uh, and I had a really great experience because uh, basically what I did was I just did art. <laughs> I, I mean, I did portraits of for my friends. I had money coming in that way because everybody was paying me to take their girlfriends. Uh, I still run into people who sit back and say, you know, you drew my mother when you were in high school. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's way before I got into photography. That was when I was just drawing and painting. You went to high school? I met my friend Cedric Adams while I was there, okay. even though he had graduated from Compton High School. Uh, I met him through West Hall. Well, actually, no, I met him through Lillian Moses, Miss, not Miss Lillian Moses, uh, Miss Moses, who ran uh, a library, the Enterprise Library in Compton, and they used to have local art shows, and that's why I met Cedric Adams, but he was uh, mentored under uh, Wes Hall, so, and Wes Hall wound up being one of my mentors, so we all hung up together and did all kinds of art projects. Now, you said when um, you were in the, the Compton Communicative Arts Academy that mm-hmm. uh, when that place went away, that everybody kind of migrated to the Watts Towers. Um, everyone uh, who knows you knows about um, your past with the Watts Towers. How did you get in, introduced into the Watts Towers? How, how, what was that like? And uh, give us an uh, idea of what, you know, when this was. Okay. Um, I went to the Watts Towers Art Center in 1976. John Andrews became the director of the Watts Towers Art Center. And I went over and volunteered for about a year and a half, you know, two years. And in 1978, he hired me on as a photography instructor to teach, photo, you know, photo classes to uh, students in the community. Uh, and that started my relationship with the Watchtowers Art Center with through John Otterbridge. And then, uh, so what I would do is teach classes and then take photographs of the community. And then you could make extra money by hanging shows. So I would help John hang the exhibitions and do, and then I wound up doing special errands and things like that for John when he needed things done. And when the festival, so used to do, we initially started out doing uh, the jazz festival, and then we started an additional festival, which was the drum festival, Day of the Drum Festival. And I would take photographs, and then that sort of then bloomed into photographs and helping run the festival, and then it was running the festival on that day, and and I just got more and more involved in it. And then in 1993, I became director of the Watch Tower Center when he retired from the position. How did you transition from uh, being a painter to a photographer? Uh, you know, you, you were once a painter, and now you're known as a photographer, mainly. How did that happen? Um, was it just a natural? Well, I always loved art at a very young age. Uh, I used to sit up and bang my head against the wall because I couldn't draw. My mother would sit down and help me because she never really got a chance to do art, but she 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 understood the fundamentals, so she would sit up and help me draw. And I saw that from that point on was known from elementary school to junior high school 
through high school, I was like one of those, the local artists. I was always the artist that I was on the yearbook and did all those type of things. Uh, I would sit up, though. My father was very much interested in films. So, you know, a little boy when he used to go and watch the nickel movie. Uh, and, and we would sit up, and he would explain to me lighting. He would say, this is why this light is there, and this is why this light is there. And then we started working at Universal. And with seeing movies made and understood how movies were being done, he would come home and explain it to me, and I was always interested in it. And I w- actually wanted to get into photography when I was at Compton High School, but, of course, the year before I got there, uh, they closed down the, the photography program. So I didn't get into photography until I was at Compton College. Uh, and then when I was at Compton College my first year there, I was very much in the art. I went to Art Center for a short period of time and uh, left to come and get some more academic uh, training while I was at Compton College. Uh, ran into David Fay, who owns David, who owns Fayline Gallery, that's up in Hollywood now, and he was uh, taking photographs on campus. And I was going like, "Who are you? White boy with shaggy hair. Uh, went went to Linwood High School. He's from South Dakota, and he was photographing the students, the, the students in the hallway. And it's not, and it wasn't except for a few teachers. Uh, there wasn't a lot of white students going to Compton College at the time, so." I asked him who he was. He said, oh, I'm teaching a class on Saturday. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting. And I decided to take the class. And uh, he used to bring in photographs of, of different famous photographers. And, and I started looking at that, and I, I've always loved photography. And I, while I was at Art Center, one of my teachers uh, who had just finished, oh, man, I remember he had just finished uh, the album cover for the Beach Boys. So how far back this was. It was the Spirit of America. He was being sued, they were being sued by everybody because he had used all these images. And he had recommended to his students that they should pick up the camera to take their own photographs instead of balling because it's like a known thing of illustrators. They'll sit up in a, in a say they're in a doctor's office, there's a magazine there. You'll see illustrators ripping pages out because they'll see a gesture of a photograph or a gesture of a hand. And I remember illustrators who had file cabinets full of photos from magazines so that they needed to see something and draw because, you know, you can't just pull out a model and say, show me your hands and just draw, like, on you know, instant on demand. So, uh I was like, well, that would be interesting. It could help my drawing. I take a class. And I took a class. got more and more involved in it. My dad respected the photography more because he understood how I could take care of myself, which was also which was good to bridge that gap between me and him. Uh, even though he loved what I did as art, he couldn't, you know, from his generation, he couldn't see how you could make money as an artist. He could understand how you could make money as a photographer. So uh, that's how I got into it. And then more and more things occurred. And uh, I took photographs at the White Stars Art Center. And they had then, a uh, dark room there, if I rem- recall, right? Mm-hmm. We had a dark room. Uh, the room is still there. I don't know if they use it anymore. But, yeah, we had a dark room. And, uh, it was a little small, one larger dark room. And we taught classes there for a number of years. A lot of students came through there. And then uh, they discontinued the photography program. I went on to... Before I became director of the Watts Arts Center, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in between that. Uh, I wound up uh, going working at Martin Luther King Hospital as senior medical photographer there for about eight years. Uh, I left there uh, when they, it was budget cuts. They discontinued my entire department, so I went to the city of Compton, became in charge of public access cable television for two years. And uh, we developed a, then, I don't know if they still do it or not, but it used to be a community awards, and I wrote the first public access grant for them and helped them ratify their contract with the cable company. Left there because that was too much of a suit job, and I, I was very, <laughs> did not like the idea of having to wear a shirt and a tie and all that stuff. So I took a job, uh, which my wife didn't like, uh, with the city of Los Angeles as a part-time photography instructor. She didn't like it because it was part time. It was less money than I was making when I was a city accountant, but it was more freedom and allowed me to, you know, go in more of a creative direction. Until I got the position, uh, they you made it full time. Worked with Mason Dooley, right? Well, I made, worked with Mason Dooley when I was at the Watch Towers Art Center. Oh, at the Art and Center. And Mason was part. Mason was part of the planning department of the city, but his, but basically he had worked his way in where all he did was take photographs. He was a real interesting brother. Mason was, Mason was a crook. 
he well, would, he would <laughs> well I can. <laughs> Mason Mason was he was a manipulator. He taught me uh, how you can if you're not careful, people will use you. And they can start out being very nice and very sweet, but if they get a chance, they'll use you. And he taught me that, which was good. I learned it at, a, at an early age. Uh, but I also learned a lot of things. I got to do a lot of photography for the city and uh, got very Hang much into helicopter. aerial photography because of the city, playing out of the city helicopters, photographing things. Okay, now how did they get project. you to do that? <laughs> hmm? How did they get you to do oh, that? Oh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, it was not. It was not really a problem. I mean, it was something different. It was interesting. Uh, I've always been very much interested in different things. So, you know, one day John Oliver said, "You know, we got the city helicopter. Let's go photograph the Watch Towers." And I loved it. And then Mason heard that I had photographed from the helicopter, and he said, "You weren't scared." I said, "No, nah, no problem." And so from that point on, when the city had there were special things come up, they would hire Mason to do it, and Mason would sub hire me, and he <laughs> I would go shoot it, and uh, <laughs> so that went on for about five years, on and off. And I, you know, it was extra money. You know, he was, I found out later on he's getting paid a lot more money than he was sub paying me, but uh, it was an experience, it was a learning experience. Like I said, I learned a lot uh, from Mason. Uh, I wish I got paid better. I wish he was a little fairer person. But, you know, those are the type of experiences that uh, did this happen. Now, now, we've mentioned a couple of times throughout this interview that you became the director of the Watts Tower Art Center. Um, can you uh, to give the audience a little idea of what that was like uh, taking over after the great John Otterbridge? What was that like uh, in his footsteps? Well, uh, you were a protege of his. Oh yeah. Well, and taking over with John, it wasn't like it was an automatic thing, because it, it, it's uh, the Record Watch Arts Air Center is a city position, which means the civil service position, which means you have to test for it. And I was uh, an artist, a full time civil service photography instructor for the city, so I took the test, and I wound up being second on the list. Uh, for art center direct, for the director's position, and the, the the brother who was ahead of me went in, and he was sort of upset because he thought it was for another art center. And when he found out it was for the Watch Towers, he actually walked out of the meeting like within 30 seconds of the meeting. The minute they said, "Oh, this is for the directorship of the Watch Towers Art Center," he didn't want any part of it. So he walked out and said, "Willie, do you know this is for the Watch Towers?" And I said, "Well, yeah, well, I can't do that." <laughs> and he just walked out. So they, I walked in. They said, "Well, you're the second one on the list." Do you want the job? And I went, yeah, okay. We talked for about 15, 20 minutes on my attitude about how about the art center and how how it should be ran and, you know, basic interview type of thing. And about a week later, I got a call, and they offered me the position, and I accepted it. And the madness started from there <laughs> on. <laughs> because running the White Star Art Center is, is – is, not like any other art center because of its location in the middle of the Watts community, which is an extremely poor community. Also, it's got a lot of violence that goes on, and a lot of stuff happens at and around the Watts Tower. I think it's calmed down a lot now, but back in uh, the 80s, 90s, and when I took over in 93, just a lot of things occurred. Because uh, it was the year, I took over the year after they had the 92 riots in Los Angeles. Uh, and I, I continuously, while I was director, kept getting reprimanded for things that I thought that we should do, but the Dallas office thought we should not. For example, uh, the anniversary of the 92 riot, the entire city of Los Angeles closed, except the Watts Towers Art Center, because we had scheduled an opening reception uh, of an exhibition that was done by Cecil Ferguson and Marion Ferguson, who I think you know. <laughs> yeah. I know. And, uh, and we, and they have they they created an exhibition about the city the history of the city of Los Angeles and we had planned to do a reception and I had been telling the downtown office and the news media coming around that you cannot plan when a riot is going to occur. It happened in '92. The entire city of LA is in a different feeling, a different place than it was in '92. So we didn't close. <laughs> we were the only thing that was open. We even had the LA SWAT team came by because they were driving around. There was absolutely nothing for them to do. So we had this crowd of people who were looking for something to do in L.A., and we were like the only facilities open. Okay, get a reprimand for that. We told you to be closed. Oh, well. 
I thought it was safe. We had the entire SWAT team down there, so it wasn't like anybody was going to do anything. Yeah. But it turned out to be a great event, and uh, I felt those were the type of things the community needed, uh, not to be closed in the middle of certain situations, but to sit back and have places for people to come and then understand what occurred. And uh, and that exhibition that Cecil and Miriam put together about the history of Los Angeles was very poignant, especially for that particular time in Los Angeles. Um, during the same time, uh, I mean, during uh, during that time, I mean, after the time that you had at Watch Towers, you moved on to uh, Barnsdall, if I recall. Well, n- well, my time at Watch Towers was not, like I said, it was not the greatest time. I was, uh, uh, they decided to get rid of me. <laughs> uh, uh, the Coastal Affairs Department decided that I was too much of a danger being director of the Watch Towers Art Center. So they decided to not clear me on probation. So I was moved to Barnsdall. They wanted to put me in a situ- in a place where uh, I would be out of sight because the community protested me being removed as our center director, and they actually picketed the Watts Tower, and that was in the news on the news and in the Los Angeles Times. So what they did was they moved me down to Barnesall and basically for almost a year gave me no work to do. I just sat up in Barnesall Park in the Hollyhock House where the then the community arts director, Earl Sherber, was uh, in charge. And I just basically sat there. And and they would give me nothing to do. I would sit there. And I, well, during that time, I actually gave me a lot of opportunity to travel because I had a lot of comp time and a lot of vacation time. And I traveled, during that time I traveled, I did a show in Atlanta, uh, in, Har- I mean, the Student Museum of Harlem. I was in the Hale Woodruff show there. So during this time I did a lot of traveling. But the city put me away, put, tried to put me away, and then I filed a grievance against the city. Uh, they, tri- they fired me. <laughs> then, they, then they had to reinstate me. And uh, during the time I was in, the t- between the time they fired me and me being reinstated, I took a position at uh, LACE, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, and I was uh, uh, the art director there for LACE, and I ran the exhibitions and the gallery and all that, and my responsibility was moving LACE from downtown L.A. to Hollywood, where it is now, and I worked for LACE for a year uh, doing exhibitions. And then I was reinstated for the, at the city, where they had to then reinstate me and pay me the entire year's salary they had, that they back salary owed me, and then I stayed with the city until I left in 2002. I remember that saga as it was playing out, and I always wondered um, how did you keep your head up through that, through all that? Oh, I don't know if I – I mean, it, it, it eventually burst around 2000. But uh, I never – at the time, there was so much stuff going on. Uh, I had to deal with the situation with the city. The city actually tried to put me in jail for stealing. That was amazing. One day, I had actually decided to not fight the city anymore. I was tired. My mother had passed. My oldest brother had died. One of my closest friends had died. And I was literally, and I had gotten offered a position at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I was planning on taking it. And my then wife didn't want to go. So I was just going to take the kids to go. She was arguing that I was going to steal the kids from her and all that stuff. And I was driving down Central Avenue, and I just decided, I'm done with this. And when I got to, and I was, then they had moved me to the L.A. Photo Center, because I had actually forced the city to move me from the Hollywood House to the L.A. Photo Center. And I got a call from the LAPD going, you've been accused of stealing materials from the Watch Towers Art Center. And I go, oh, I did? Yes, you've been accused of this. And we need you to come down and talk to us uh, the next day. Okay. So I went down to the, what was it, 108th Street, where the police station is. I think it's called 77th Division. And it's a beautiful sister detective, I forget her name now, who was sitting there. She said, oh, Mr. Mover, come in this room. I walked into this room that looked like a pillbox. I'm a big guy, so there's like no room. And standing behind me are two big white cops <laughs> whose purpose there is to arrest me. Because I'm, I'm there to actually be arrested for stealing. So I'm, I'm sitting there, and they're, they're so close to me, I can feel them on my shoulders. And she's sitting in front of me. And she goes, well, you're the, you're the suspect of stealing materials from the Watch Towers Art Center. And I go, okay, I'm the only suspect? They said, when you talked to me on the phone, you said there were other suspects. No, no, you're the only suspect. 
the community arts director, Earl Sherburn, came down here the day before yesterday and put in the charge that you had stolen these materials. Okay. Now, this is actually 14 months later, after I had been removed from being uh, director of the Lost Stars Arts Center, and I'm back to being just a photo instructor. Okay, I'm sitting there. i got the two big white cops standing behind me. They're mumbling like, oh, my God, this guy is big. Uh, we're going, this is going to be a fight. And, I mean, you can just hear them. I mean, I'm like, there's no way for me not to hear them. They're just talking about, man, I don't want to, I don't want to be here. How did I get this? You go low and I'll go high. And I'm sitting there, and she's, she's, she's talking to stuff, and I'm going like, okay. She says, so where do you work now, Mr. Middlebrook? And I go, I work for the Coastal Affairs Department, City of Los Angeles. And she goes, no, 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 we knew you were the director of the Watch Towers Arts Center when this occurred, but where do you work now? And I say, I work for the Coastal Affairs Department, City of Los Angeles. Here's my ID. Call the personnel department. At that point, I said I told them that my position was a civil service position, so when I didn't clear probation, I didn't get fired from the position. I just reverted back to my old civil service position. At which point, the police officers patted me on the shoulder and left the room. Because they knew this was like shitty stuff. No one would sit back and steal a few, a few dollars worth of material and lose their full-time civil service job. Right. So I sat back and told her, and she said, well, uh, well, they didn't tell us you were still working. I said, yes, I still work for the city. And I gave her a list of everybody who had keys to the art center and everybody who had passwords. And she said, well, you're the only one who had keys. I said, wait, this is a city facility. There's, a hundred, there's not one city building that has one key. There's at least 20 keys from supervisors to maintenance to security to the police. Okay, she said, well, we're going to look into this and we'll get back to you. So I was, I had went to Chicago because I was on the board of directors for the Society for Photographic Educators, and we were having our national conference in Chicago. And while I was there, I got a call from the officer. She said, Mr. Middleberg, I have good news from you. You are no longer a suspect in the theft of the materials from the Watch Charles Art Center. I said, well, oh, wow, that's great. And she said, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad I just want to let you know. I said, okay, uh, could, you, could you ask me a question? And she said, sure. And I said, well, who did it? Who took the material? She said, oh, well, the case is closed. I said, wait a minute, you mean the case is closed because I'm no longer a suspect? And she hung up on me. <laughs> so my time with the city of L.A. has been great and extremely crazy. <laughs> You know, one of the beautiful things that came out of all that was how the community uh, supported you. What did you think of that when that was going down? How the how they uh, supported you during that? Oh, I thought it was. I think I thought it was great. I think it's great because it got the community even more involved with the art center in a different way uh, than other than just coming to the event. Uh, and uh, and it, they, the community has always been in, <clears throat> involved with the Watch Towers. But then they got involved with the overall department politically, and uh, and they still are, which I think is great. Now, um, you were a professor <laughs> at Compton College. Um, hmm? So what was mm-hmm. that ex- you were a professor at Compton College. What was that experience like? And how did you uh, how did you find your way to Compton College? Okay, well, you know, I originally went to Compton College as a student back in, uh, when was it? When I graduated from 75, I went there and it was graduated. was in a different location then, right? Hmm? Well, the college wasn't it in a different location. No, 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 it's in the same location. The oh. college moved in the 50s to the location they're in now. Oh, okay. Uh, so I got there as a student, and, well, I had been going there as a student while I was in, in high school. I graduated from 70, 79 from the college uh, with my a dual degree because I had enough units for an art and photography associate degree. So I'd taken all the art courses and I took all the photo courses. And then I decided I would just go on the streets and learn photography. And then I taught at Cal State LA for about five years, photography. Uh, and uh, the photo instructor there, uh, Darnell Mitchell, asked me when I come in and teach a couple of evening courses for him in photography. So I started teaching some evening courses. Then they offered him a position as head of athletics at Compton College. And I took over teaching all the photo courses, part, all, all the photo courses part-time. So I'm actually teaching a full load, and I'm still working at the time for the city of Los Angeles. So in, 19, in 2000, I 
was offered a position as full-time photography instructor at Compton College, teaching digital photography and traditional photography. And in 2001, we dropped traditional photography and went to all digital photography. And I was there until 2007 when uh, when the college was taken over by El Camino, they decided that they would write my my program and other other programs like out of uh, the budget just to save money. They wrote out computer graphics, digital engineering, digital photography, digital video. Uh, it was just a really a strange situation, but that was part of that situation with the college. When they lost its accreditation, it was taken over El Camino. So they wrote my position out, and uh, which was actually one of the things that happened in my life is everything has a reason. And what it does is it got me back in doing uh, photography. And uh, I mean, back in doing photography, back in doing art. Uh, I'm, and I'm working now on doing a number of public art pieces for the county and for the city. Uh, and I'm taking care of myself solely as an artist, which is something I've ne actually never done. Uh, I've always had jobs. This is the first time I've not had a job. And I'm actually being me as an artist, and I'm doing public art pieces. And uh, I have freedom to do things on my own pace and the way I like to do them. So this is, like, really a good time in my life. And you as an artist, um, how would you describe your style? What, what would you say to describe it? Oh, it's sort of hard to uh, to put it down into any type of – because I, 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 I don't want to limit myself. I'm a two-dimensional artist. I do majority, well, actually, I do almost everything I do is on the computer. Now, uh, I don't do any darkroom work anymore because there's no reason to do it. Uh, so I'm in the digital. So I do some traditional digital photography, which is just regular-looking found imagery. And then I do manipulated images, which I actually started doing more manipulation before I even got digital when I started doing uh, uh, photo paintings, uh, which are these very large photographs where I would drip developer and paint with window squeegees and spray bottles and sponges to achieve these really expressionistic images. Uh, I'm still very much into that, but I'm not into doing the in the darkroom work now. I'm doing it all on the computer. Uh, I'm assuming you don't miss the darkroom. Oh no, <laughs> no 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 no. Uh, the good thing about the darkroom was that when you were in classes, you're. You, uh, as a student, and when you were classes as a teacher, you got to meet so many different people. The problem with the dark room is you're in a dark room. <laughs> uh, you have to deal with running water and chemicals. I don't miss any photochemicals. I don't miss any running water, temperature, gauges. Uh, you have to be in, you have to go into places that are totally dark to roll film in the little canisters. Uh, if you're in there with a bunch of students and somebody had mixed up the chemicals, you could have your photos disappear. Uh, you're stuck with 36 shots on a roll of film. Now you can go buy a little card that can hold thousands upon thousands of shots without going carrying hundreds of rolls of film. Uh, so I'm very much into the digital thing. So I don't miss the dark room or any of that. Would you suggest to a young photographer to start off at the dark room level? No. <laughs> no. Just skip it. There's absolutely no reason for it. Uh, I'm happy that I did, but I went through a lot of changes. Like, for example, when I first got in photography, I got a job with a photographer in the city of Compton uh, named Willie Brown, who is no longer with us. And I would work out of his garage. And he had um, makeshift, he did a lot of the local political work. So Willie would go out on the night and come back with two rolls of film, and the, the two rolls of 36 would have maybe 50 jobs on them. Two shots here, a shot there, and I process the film, and I come back, and he's cut all the wet film up and got clothes pins. They're all sticking on clothes pins, and he's going print a hundred of this, print two hundred of that, and and literally you have to go into a dark into your dark room with the enlarger on and print these pictures one at a time. And then he had a big drum dryer that to dry them on. This is before you had resin coated paper, which are RC papers with self drying. Uh, and he'd want them with a big shine. It was called a tackle drum dryer. And it was gas-driven. You have to light it. And I turned the gas on. You have to get the gas right. If you didn't get it, if it was too rich and you light it, it would blow your eyebrows off. <laughs> the drum would heat up. 
you put Prince on, you hear the Prince frying. It'd be like you're frying bacon in the morning. And you hear, and they go around this giant drum, and they come off, and when they hit the cold air, they shoot at you. <laughs> that was an experience, but believe me, I don't think I need to pass that on to anybody. <laughs> Two, you don't have to worry about temperature control with digital, where you, if you're doing black and white, you're safer. If you're doing color, it's very critical. Color chemicals are absolutely corrosive. Uh, if you don't uh, do certain things with them when you're denutralizing them, they will eat, they will eat PVC pipe color chemicals. You have, you have in black and white maybe a three to five degree range. In color, you have a one to three degree range. If you're off, it could be too red if you're, or too blue, or it could go green if the stuff's contaminated. If something's wrong and you're out of sequence, you ruin the entire roll of film. Uh, and it costs a ton of money. I mean, I can go a job now and I have a compact flash card I, and I, that I have on my digital camera. And I estimated that that would cost me, in just film alone, about $400. But I can do with this one compact flash card. And that would be buying the rolls of film and processing them. I use this one compact flash card. I can shoot 1,400 photographs. Stick it in my computer and download them all in. Done. <laughs> wow. So that's the advance of the technology. And the bottom line on photography is not about all of the other the gadgets and all that stuff. It's about your eye and what you can see and what you can put in the viewfinder and what you can achieve with it. You can have the greatest equipment in the world. Matter of fact, a friend of mine, Dennis Caldwood, really well known photographer, uh, before the digital thing came in, would go get these little cheap uh, $25 cameras. And you put your little roll of film in them. He'd have a whole bag full because, you know, have, each one have a different lens. And he'd go shoot these actually fantastic photographs with these little cheap throwaway cameras. So it's, it's about what you're willing to do. It's about you working with it. it does, the camera doesn't make you. You make it. So you can have, like, the most expensive camera in the world and produce absolutely awful photographs. Because I see a lot of that all the time. Who are you, some of your contemporaries that you respect? and uh, love to see their photography. Mm. It's, so, it's cha- See, the, the, the one of the things about digital is changing, mm-hmm. okay, where there are straight photographers and then there are the ones who do manipulation. Straight photographers, when I say straight, are the found, who produce found imagery, which means they go out and photograph things. Uh, and then, of course, then they're the ones who are in the more photograph manipulation toward art. Uh, I have a lot of photographers I respected. I have respected over the years. Uh, just a number of people that are out there. Uh, Eli Reed, for example, photographer, now professor at uh, uh, in Texas, who's a magnum photographer, outstanding, outstanding photographer. Tony Gleaton, Carrie Mae Wings, Lorna Simpson. Uh, just so many, you know, really people that <clears throat> I've had an opportunity to work with. I've known. Uh, but I've also had some really great teachers, uh, some really outstanding people. I mean, uh, Roy DiCarava, who's recently passed away, I've had some really great discussions with him. Uh, I got to meet James Van Der Zee. Wow. James Van Der Zee is just a master who photographed years in Harlem. Uh, Gary Winogrand, master of street photography. Max Yavno, another master of street photography, president of the old photo league in the 40s and 50s. Uh, in the four, 30s and 40s, uh, you know, Lou Steumann, uh professor who passed away some years ago, professor of film at uh, UCLA, was a great friend, and we spent a lot of time talking about photography and different events. So I've been really lucky as far as mentors. And then again, as artists, I mean, just general. See, I, I, I don't look at it as just, okay, I want to hang with photographers. I've been lucky. I hang with painters. Cedric Adams, an outstanding pencil artist, uh, Richard Wyatt, Tony Love, uh, Charles Dixon, Timothy Washington, uh, just artists who do a lot of things. And I, and I try to tie that into what I do photographically as far as my vision and when I'm doing manipulated work as far as my approach and technique to tell the stories I want to tell with my work. And it's all about telling really great stories. I just want to remind the audience that this is Art Beat. And our guest today is uh, artist, photographer, professor, 
Willie Robert Middlebrook. Uh, uh-huh. We have a, our call-in number is 347-855-8305. That's 347-855-8305. I know we have a caller that's hanging on. We're, we're going to get to you in a minute. But just call the number, hit one, and uh, we'll we'll get you into the show. Um, <clears throat> now I'd like to talk to talk to you about some of the work you've done. Um, uh, the Black Angel series. Um, mm-hmm. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? <clears throat> well, the Black Angel series. Okay, one of the ways I guess. When earlier you asked me how I dealt with all the different situations and pressures and things that go on, and I do it by creating work. Um, the Black Angel series meant a lot to me because each one of the images, there's little sub stories that go on that were going on in my life. They're almost like diary pages, and uh, it was also the period where I was transitioning to digital. And so the Black Angel series was both me creating these really great images uh, about angels, uh, about the need to believe in different things, and translating myself from doing traditional photography to working on the computer and then being able to basically use the computer as my painting tool. I don't consider the computer any more than a very expensive very heavy brush, and uh, so that's what got me into doing the Black Angels. Plus, of course, all the problems that were going on in my life. I needed some kind of an outlet, and the Black Angels wound up being that. I wanted to, to sit back and come up with a fantasy attitude about the reality that I dealt with. And uh, so I was taking pictures. People I have photographed wound up being angels. And uh, there are all kinds of, like I said, little stories in there. And uh, one of these I'd like to get back to it. I haven't had a chance to uh, get back to it. I had a show at USC with the Black Angels in uh, 2001. And uh, I think that went off really well. Uh, but I want to get one day I'm going to get back to doing the angels. But, uh, yeah, that's what it was about. It was a way of me releasing a lot of pressure. And, uh, and that's how it worked. Matter of fact, it, it, when things get really bad, I sit down and work. If not, I'd probably be out there. They'd probably sit back. You see me on the evening news. That wouldn't be a good thing. <laughs> so. Now, uh, you've done many public artworks. Um, I'll start you off with a portrait of my people. Can you tell us about that piece and where it's located? And then kind of tell us about some of the other public artworks that you've done and possibly have in the future, if you can share anything. But uh, oh. start off with a portrait of my people, because that one is uh, kind of special to me, and uh, I think you know why. So uh, okay. can you tell us about it? Okay. Uh, that is a mural that's on the Avalon Station of the Green Line on the lower level. And what happened was there were a group of artists. Well, they were selecting artists. And, of course, there were. I was up against John Otterbridge, and Stan Wilson. What is the process where your work is selected, they look at your work, and then a a committee picks uh, the artist. So what happened was we wound up being the three of us there. Of course, you all know, John's my mentor. Stan Wilson is one of those artists that I've heard about for years. He was then professor at Pomona. And we wound up collaborating. We were actually the first collaboration uh, with the Metro Art Program. And so we we collaborated to create the station. John Otterbridge created a multifaceted pyramid. Stan Wilson created different symbols from Africa that wound up being symbols in the tiling of the floor and on the different uh, ban- banisters on the station. I designed the actual look of the station, and I created a mural. And the mural, what I did was I wanted to sit back and do something to the artist. I always hear, you know, there's always politicians. You see these portraits of politicians etc. I wanted to do something to the artists, the people who had motivated me. Uh, so what I did was I created this mural with all these different different artists that had uh, affected me uh, from growing up. I worked with at the, at the Community Arts Academy. I worked with at the Watch Towers. I worked with uh, other different art pro- projects. So there were like 33 artists on the, 
on the, the mural. And uh, 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 Cecil Ferguson, his wife Miriam, and uh, this guy named Kente are on the <laughs> on the mural. Yeah, I, I know that guy. Uh-huh. Uh huh. As far as other pieces, uh, I did a really great piece in Shreveport, Louisiana, working with the community, working with the art with the art community and the community to create a series of uh, a traveling exhibition of. Uh, very large, 48, four feet by four foot pieces about different aspects of the Shreveport community. I was there for over a month. Uh, those pieces were lost on a fire recently, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm working with them. Uh, about I have I copied all I copied photographed all the images. So what I'm doing now is working on reprinting those on canvas and then up to four four feet by four feet, and then they're going to be given back to the community of Shreveport. So I'm working on that. I'm working on a public art piece with the LA Art Commission uh, for the Florence Firestone Station right now. Uh, that? I'm also working on a met on my How's second that? metro station. Oh, the, the sec I'm on my second metro station. Uh, this one would be I get a I, the reason why I wanted to do this one because the last one was done with John Oliver and Stan Wilson, so it's like the three of us. This one I get to say is mine. <laughs> and uh, so that's coming along. The artwork is completed. We're getting ready to get into fabrication, so that should be finished within. Uh, by the end of this year or beginning of next year. So that's the exposition line, which is we're going from downtown to down Exposition Boulevard and ending somewhere on the other side of Los Angeles. I have the Crenshaw uh, Exposition Station. So done that, I've done some other public art pieces for the Annenberg Foundation. Uh, this was small public art in Florida. Uh, Looks like I probably might be going to Mexico to do a public art piece. I'm up for a public art piece in Canada. It's between me and this other person. So, uh, and I'm on the list to do a public art piece for the new, what is it, <laughs> Tom Bradley facility. One of the artists who online to do the bathroom, to create art to go into the new bathroom. So they just broke ground on that. So I figure somewhere in the now in the next two or three years, uh, might be be working on that. So, you know, keeping me involved with the public art is very important, plus it keeps me alive. I got a COLA fellowship in 2009, 2008, 2009, uh, and I've been working with the WLCAC at the Cecil Ferguson Gallery for the last year. What, I'm, what, I, what I would like to do is talk to you about your work at WLCAC and the uh, 24-7 exhibit. But what I'm going to do right now is we're going to take a quick break, so just hold on, Willie. And when we sure. come back, we're going to take some calls. So, uh, okay. So just hold on. We'll take a quick break. Now, you're listening to Artbeat. Our guest today is uh, Willie Middlebrook. We're going to take a break and be right back. Hello, um, welcome back I'm to here. Artbeat. Uh, how you doing, Willie? Okay. We have a caller who uh, wants to talk to you. Hello, caller. Okay. 
Willie, what's going on? How you been, brother? <laughs> I'm fine. Damon? <laughs> but of course. <laughs> so how you doing? How's the twins? Oh, man, they just turned one two weeks ago, man. Damn, yeah, they it's been just... that long? Yeah, look, it's been that long, you know, getting teeth, starting to walk, tearing up everything. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. Yeah. What hey, you want to ask me? Shit, I heard, hey, I heard Mexico, we going back? What's up? <laughs> uh, I don't know. They're going to be doing the fabrications for my station there in, Me- in Mexico, and I'm going to be in an exhibition. Remember Lewis and Duarte, who we almost went to jail in Mexico with? Yes, I do. Casa de Cultura. Yeah, well, his, his, his gallery, uh, La Casa, the exhibition man at Avenue 50 right now is going to be there in June. Okay. At his gallery in Tijuana, so uh, I'm probably going to go there. Okay, well, you need to get that. Well, yeah, keep me in the loop. But I won't be in the, but I won't be in the car with Luis because we do not want to talk about the Luis story. Yeah, we're gonna drive by ourselves. That's the most expensive bottle of tequila I've ever purchased. So, so can you can you tell the audience uh, your uh, relationship to uh, Mr. Richardson? Oh, uh, I met Damon at uh, Compton College. He was uh, doing graphic arts there, and took some of my classes, and we've been friends ever since. And uh, I was honored by Mexico. Uh, when was that, Damon? Yes. I want. I'm trying to remember when was that. That was. Uh, was that 2000? It was 2000. I, yeah, I guess it was 2000. Yeah, it was 2000. Summer 2000, or just about. So I was honored by Mexico, and they have this this annual biannual exhibition of photography, and I was the honored photographer. And the head of culture came down and met us. And Damon went with me to Mexico. We drove in to Tijuana because it's at the the House of Culture, which was an old high school, which is now just a big uh, two four story uh, art complex. And uh, we went in there, and the curator Luis and Duarte drove us around the community, and we almost got arrested <laughs> because he was <decided laughs> to do turns in the middle of the street. Wow! And uh, but we got out because. Uh, he paid the police officer forty dollars and he let us go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! So, me and Dave was sitting in the car. We were trying to hide our money, and our, we had got new cell phones, and we were hiding our cell phones, and we had got new digital cameras. We were trying to hide under the car. Oh man! And kept talking, and the cop kept trying to say we're going to the police. And I'm telling Louise, don't move the car. I'm telling Louise, don't move the car. And the cops just keep going like, follow me to the station. I'm going like, I'm not going to a Mexican jail. Man. And then Luis sitting in his Vons car, car Daniel finally got his wife in the back seat to be quiet. Because every time she opened the car, the cop kept looking at her like he was going to shoot her. And then <laughs> when, the cop left, when the cop left, she was going like, why did he want his Vons car? car? I said, so Luis put $40 behind it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all because Damon wanted to get a bottle of tequila before hey, the left. <laughs> two bottles, man. Two bottles. <laughs> So that was like that's one of those experiences an artist run into when they do things, you know. So uh, yeah, man. That was the night I was, there, and then we, we we then we left, so it was cool. <laughs> what was it like uh, having uh, Willie as a uh, professor? Oh, uh, the experience was incredible, guys. I mean, you know, if you if you guys want to know the short version of the true story, you know, I was a you know mid flight kind of graphic designer guy using Corel Draw. Walked into the photo lab one day, seeing this big black guy with dreads. And wondering, you know, who was he and why was everybody gathered around him like he was, you know, something special. But, you know, as time went on, you know, and I began to, you know, kind of evolve out of my other career, which was bounty hunting. If anybody had any relatives, you know, snatched up, they probably got snatched up by me in L.A. Um, you know, he said, look, hey, I can show you this stuff. It's a safer and a better way for you to make a living. You could probably make probably just as much money or be just as satisfied with what you're doing. And, I mean, you know, like I said, it's been an incredible experience because, you know, you know, he's been a teacher, you know, he's been a friend, he's been a brother, you know, he's been a mentor, he's been that ear. You know, he showed me an outlet to, you know, be able to let my frustration out, you know, because of him, you know, I'm into digital photography and like my kids are like 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 totally like into the camera from the moment they were literally, you know, being C sections out, you know, they were in front of the camera. So people oftentimes wonder why when I pull a camera out today my kids start to pose at one years old, I tell them, Hey, you know, Willie told me that if you're, if you put your kids in front of a camera from day one, when they see a camera, you know, they'll they'll know that it's showtime. And, you know, that's how it's been. 
So, you know, I, I, I often credit all my many, you know, success and accolades, you know, to Willie just for him, you know, being there. You know, and also, you know, building, you know, that digital media program up at Compton College, you know, that they, you know, kind of dismantled and, you know, recycled, but we ain't even go there yet. You know, you know, that's a whole other show. <laughs> yeah, because uh, Damon got me a lot at Compton because when we finally, when we were finally able to hustle some equipment from the college, <laughs> he, he helped me set it all up. So, uh. And then when they finally moved us, when they were going to they get ready to bulldoze the building we were in, then I had to call David up to help me. And we moved all the, the digital stuff in one day by ourselves. And, remember, and that's when they moved us into the wood shop. Uh huh. So the elite. We had the computers in between uh, saws, and it, it was an experience trying to get this thing going in Compton. Oh yeah. It was when it, it was sad when uh, they didn't respect it enough to keep it. Exactly. But you know. You 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 don't have control. I you don't have control of the politics. But I swear, if they need a um a schedule cover, who they gonna call? Well, I'm not going back there. So. Yeah, yeah, nor me. You know, I hate to. I, you know, I hate what to say. I got some really great people there. Oh yeah. Uh, as a teacher, but it was really strange when I was part time. There were teachers who wouldn't even talk to me. <laughs> and then when I full time, I'm standing up in the bathroom. I just become full time instructor, and uh, this, this teacher walks in who taught engineering, and he goes, "Hi, how are you doing?" I was in like, "Man, I've been part time here for four years, and you would walk past me like I was nothing." Well, you're full time now, and I don't talk to part timers. Mr. Sagafi. <laughs> Oops, did I say his name? And to show you how crazy El Camino was when they took over time to college, he taught engineering on the computer, which is a major course right now. Why do you discontinue his program? Right. Computer graphics is one of the major jobs in California. It is a $30 billion industry. Why do you cut out that from the students at Compton? But that's what they did. Yep. You know, and there was no justification for, no justification for it. But they just did it. But it was, it was, it was like I said, it was a good thing. It's all for a reason. It was a reason I needed to leave. So I'm just taking it on the high road. It was a reason for me to leave. Right. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Richardson, uh, for uh, calling in. And uh, we'll be talking to you later. And please continue to listen to Art Beat. All right. Good show, Kente. Hey, will you take care? I'll be in touch. Okay. Take care. Uh, all righty. Uh, we have another uh, caller on the line, uh, area code 941. Hello? Hello, Mr. Hey, hello. Who's this? It's your son, uh, Martin. Martin. Hey, Martin, how you doing? I'm doing good. I was listening to the show. Oh, great. Martin's in Florida. Yeah, how's hey, Florida doing? doing? Your son. This is your son, right? Yes. yes. Uh, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. Man, I love the show, man. I was just listening in. You know, I've been listening in since the beginning. I love everything I heard. It's awesome. I'm so stoked for you, Daddy. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so how's everything going? Oh, it's okay. That's good. Uh, when, Martin was, when Martin was here, Martin was uh, my, my assistant, and he helped me hang the exhibitions at the WLCAC and other places, and uh, uh, would help me work on projects. Uh, I'm still working on that one at Forest Firestone, so if they ever work that out, I will be giving you a call to come out to assist me finishing it. I just, right. I'm just waiting now for them to make up their mind on what they're going to do. Ah, all right. Well, that's good. You know, Florida's all right. You know, I miss you and everything. Oh, yeah, well, have fun. You know, as long as you're having fun and I know you're okay, I don't have no problem. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. So you yeah. taking any pictures? Uh, No, not yet. Why? I was going to. What? <laughs> huh? No, I was Take going to. Take some pictures. I was going to, you know, camera kind of collecting a little dust, but, you know. Well, I'll put take it off work. and go take the picture. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Martin is uh, you, uh, uh, you have uh, how many children do you have, and which one does Martin? What Martin is the youngest, yes. and uh, five. of five. Five. And the name? Mm-hmm. Uh, Akila, <laughs> Trira, <laughs> Jessica, Willie, and Martin. 
And you have grandchildren as well, right? I have grandchildren. <laughs> you <laughs> <laughs> don't ask their names because everybody'd be mad because I don't remember anything. Yeah. I'm terrible at that. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not terrible. Hi, <laughs> Nancy. Uh, dang, the youngest baby. Kaya, the youngest one. To, you uh, say it, Martin. You know. Uh, it's Nancy, Kaya, um, Rosalia. There's Carrie. There's Jaisea. Okay, that's it. That would be it. Yes. Yeah, you throw any more in there, and, uh, and there's somebody else. <laughs> I'm not counting. I'm not counting anybody else. That's all the kids, okay? Anybody else out there? Don't call me. I'm not taking any responsibilities for anything. I was down. What can I say? Well, uh, thank you, Martin, for calling in. All right, and uh, please continue to listen to our beat. Oh, that I will. I'll be listening to it more often now. All right, man. All right. Take care, Martin. Okay, um, now, before we took the break, we were talking about uh, the, your work at WLCAC. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of talk, kind of tell the audience who may not know, what is WLCAC, what does it stand for, and what is the organization? Okay, WLCAC, Watts Labor Community Action Committee, was started 45 years ago by Ted Watkins and a group of uh, citizens of the Watts community as an organization to... Uh, assist the community in uplifting itself. So back in, I think it was in 96, uh, the organization decided to expand. I mean, they've done things like housing and food programs and uh, things like that, uh, but they wanted to go expand even more and offer co- programs dealing with culture to uplift not only physically but spiritually by offering exhibitions, jazz, programs, festivals, et cetera. Uh, and so in 96, they named uh, a gallery after Cecil Ferguson, who is uh, uh, known throughout Southern California as a curator, uh, worked at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And so they named the gallery after uh, Mr. Ferguson. So last year, they decided, which was 2009, that they want to do a series of exhibitions because they had sort of fallen off of what they were doing. And uh, with Tim Watkins, the CEO of WLCAC, and Mr. Ferguson, they decided they were going to create a series of exhibitions called Watts 24-7, which would be a two-month solo show of 12 artists. So each artist would get two months of a solo exhibition of their work. And uh, 24-7 means we need to be uh, open. The 12 artists gets two months, that's the 24 and the gallery is open seven days a week. So I was the first artist that was selected to exhibit, and then I've been in charge of coordinating the gallery and making sure the exhibitions uh, open on time, that the artists uh, get to work there and do everything basically to oversee the running of the gallery. So we're on our of the 24-7 of the 12 artists. We're on, I think, our fifth artist right now. Who and are that's the, the artists? Who are the other uh, the artists? artist was uh, Gary Sonatis, was uh, an artist from Haiti who lives in Inglewood. Uh, beautiful work. He was the second artist. Uh, after him was Michael Massenberg, uh, another great local artist who's done a lot of uh, national and international work. Great guy. Uh, Margaret Garcia, uh, great Latina artist. Uh, and now we have Alphonse Gerber, who has a... Uh, an exhibition that he actually did at WLCAC 10 years ago of the Watts community, and it gives you a good chance to look back and see some of the things that have changed in the community over the 10-year period. Uh, and then next artist will be Charles Dixon. Oh, wow. And then we're going to have Alma Lopez and then Tony Love, uh, Elliot Pinkney. Uh, we have Carlos Spivey coming up, and uh, Noni be are the other artists that fill out the 24-7. Then after that, then the organization will go into one month or two months regular exhibitions uh, that will be selected and put together. But the 24-7 is their coming out party, you might say. That's, that's wonderful. And uh, whose concept was the 24-7? Uh, uh, the concept was Cecil Ferguson. Uh, 
who is uh, a consultant to the WLCAC, and uh, and then he worked it out with uh, uh, Timothy Watkins, the executive director. And uh, I think it was a great concept, and it's going really well. Uh, these artists get a chance. I mean, the two months give you an, a chance to really see and look into look at the artist's work. So you get a chance to come back. You know, you don't have to worry about rushing, getting away in a month. So you get a full chance to really get a chance to see and explore the artist's work. So it's been really great. We've had uh, a number of different, uh, like the local one of the local high schools, uh, the, the King Drew Medical Magnet. The students came by. We had like all day. We had busloads of children that came through to see the different exhibitions. Uh, and we had the artists there to talk to them about their work. For example, Michael Massenberg was there, and we had over four or five hundred students come through and and talk to him and look at his work and see what he was doing, what he was talking about. And uh, so it's, it's it's been a really great experience, and it's just getting better. That's great. Um, so, um, how is your how is the experience working in Watts at the Cecil Ferguson Gallery? At uh, WLCAC, I'm, you know it's a black-owned institution, so that must feel real good to to do what you love at a black institution that has such a history like WLCAC. Um, what is oh that? yeah, well it's, it's it's great it is great because it is ours. You know, it's it's an organization that's been around for 45 years. Uh, it started come it came out of 1965, which was the, the revolt that happened that put Watts on the map. Uh, of course, the community has changed, but it's great to work with all aspects of the community. It was really great that we could sit back and say this is something that came from our community that is showing artists that have worked in or come from the community that are world-class uh, caliber. And uh, and you get to, you know, pat yourself on the back and you have some pride to show the community from young people to senior citizens what they can do, what they can be involved in. Uh, so uh, and we have future exhibitions planned. You know, in the future of doing things with senior citizens, uh, there's a senior citizen program of the Watts community that meets at the WLCC every month. They do Bones and Blues every month. They do these great jazz concerts with these fantastic jazz musicians. Uh, they have festivals they do throughout the year and special events. So it's just really, really great to uh, be associated with an organization of that of that caliber and to be able to do and show that we can do. Uh, shows that you can see it like at the LA County Museum, et cetera, here at uh, in Watts. I mean, uh, Margaret Garcia, who's a part of the Cheech Marin collection, uh, uh, has exhibited throughout the country uh, at LA County Museum. Uh, Michael Massenberg, who's done a lot of ex exhibiting, a, a great public artist. He's got a mural in the Jazz Muse Museum in, in Kansas. A uh, number of public art pieces throughout Los Angeles. Gary Sonatas, like I said, is, is an artist who relocated from Haiti. Uh, the absolutely great, really beautiful, vibrant work. Uh, so, and, you, and, you, and you'll be able to see artists like Noni Olabisi, who's a, a local artist who's done some great murals throughout Los Angeles. Tony Love, who is the uh, artist, the resident artist at the WLCAC, who paints, who does portraits of all of the jazz musicians who perform there. Uh, it's just really uh, 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 the opportunity we have. And the great thing about WLCC is not city-owned, state-owned, or uh, or a county facility. It's a private facility, and uh, and it's community-run. And that and that's one of the things that's really great about it. Well, we have uh, one more caller. Um, mm -hmm. One one second. Sure. Um, caller. Hello, caller. Hello. Hi. Oh, hey. Hello. This is Miriam Ferguson. I was Hi, just Mr. enjoying. I'm enjoying you all so very much, oh, and I just wanted to let you know how much I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Um, how, and, long, how long, how long uh, have you known uh, Willie Middlebrook? 
I've known Willie since he was about 17 or 18 years old. I first met him at the Compton Communicative Arts Academy and where they were doing uh, such overwhelmingly wonderful and artistic, creative things there. The young people and their uh, mentors were just fabulously uh, endowed with creative abilities. Thank you. And I also have been a student of Willie Robert Middlebrook in the uh, digital photography at Compton College, where he is just, he has been such an influence over the students because of his wealth of knowledge and ability. And it just gives me great pleasure to hear you speaking and talking about some of the things that have gone on in your life. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I'm very so happy I, hope, I hope this uh, program will continue and to go and grow because we need lots of artistic uh, venues where we can talk about the creative aspect of our lives. I agree. Thank you. I agree as well. Thank you so much, caller. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Have a blessed evening, and we'll talk to you again at another time. Hello. Hello. I'm here. Hello. Yeah, one more caller. Caller, you're there. This is Cecil. Hello. <laughs> hey, Mr. Ferguson, how you doing? Well, I couldn't go on without getting into this act. <laughs> you know, I, I was sitting there listening to you, Willie, and all mm -hmm. the good times and bad times and that we've had since I first met you. Very fortunate because you was a photo journalist. Mm -hmm. And I came to the view. Came down to watch I was in the 70s and the 80s. And, uh, you know, I worked in the museum. And when I finally found out they had a photo journalist working there, I also never knew I worked at the watch office. Don't be for you. <laughs> but people hide records. But I was, I was a stickler for documentation. Mm -hmm. And we did some wonderful shows together. They'll always be grateful and always be a part of my life. Oh, thank you. I, I am, I am, I am honored to uh, have, have worked with you and Mrs. Ferguson and Kente. Uh, the first show we did together was uh, the women, the contributions of women to watch, where we went around and photographed, and I did the portraits of the women, and and, and I learned so much from just that experience alone. So I will always be in your debt. And I am very, very, uh, like I said, honored to to work with you and look forward to working with you more. It goes full circle because I'm very proud of my son. Mm -hmm. I hope uh, he don't be a starving artist. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. <laughs> of all fields, he picked to be art art programs. <laughs> he, he should have took a lesson from me. You don't make no money. But I'm very proud of him. Mm -hmm. And he, he did his all himself too, because I was surprised to hear Martin, because I didn't know he had done that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's good. And uh, you know I'll be seeing you. Mm -hmm. I'll be seeing you also. Good day. Uh, yes. Lots of luck, brother. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> all right. That's cool. Anytime I talk to Mr. Ferguson, it's cool. And Ms. Ferguson. Well, uh, Great Willie. People. Great people. Well, Willie, it's been a really good show. I'd like to um, thank you once again. I've known you for a very long time, and uh, you've always been a, a mentor to me and someone that I've always really respected. Um, you know, I don't know if I get a chance to tell you that a lot, but you're someone that I definitely um, take cues from. And I really appreciate 
all you've done for the arts community, and I appreciate your work very much. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I've ever told you that, but that's definitely how I feel. So you're definitely Oh, thank favorite. you. Thank you very much. You're one of my I'm, favorites. I am deeply right. honored. I am um, deeply actually, honored. Uh, we're about to round it up, but we have one more call coming Okay. In. So uh, hold on one second. Mm, sure. Hello, caller 842. Hello? Oh, hello. Yeah, it's me, Mike. Oh, hey, what's up, man? Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, man, how you doing? Artist oh, man, I'm hanging there. Can everybody hear me? Uh-huh, I can hear you. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm not used to the, the blog radio. This is my first time doing a blog radio. So uh, first I'd like to, uh, man, I'd like to commend the Art Beat, Kente, for the work you're doing. This is phenomenal. It's great. Uh, without this, there's a, you give voices to the ones who need to be heard. And, uh, man, this is wonderful. And, uh, and also congratulations to Willie. Greatly an honor to be a friend through the years. And, uh, man, one of the greatest artists I've known, even if I had never met you, and I'm glad I had, and even a greater person. So, oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's us working. See, that's the thing. It's us working together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I love being around artists. If we don't do nothing but sit and talk, I love being around artists. Yeah. And when we work together, we do great stuff. I know. Yeah, inspiring. You are, I mean, the hardest, yeah. you are the hardest working brothers I know in the art. <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm trying to keep up with you. <laughs> well, you you was there before me, so I just kind of, you know, watch you, observe you through the years, and you've been through a lot personally and professionally, and uh, and you give a lot. I mean, you're a family man, true and true. I mean, you you give to the community. I mean, I don't know. There's not too many people who could have handled what you have done, and uh, and some people that know you personally know that, but the public may not even know. They just they see the beautiful work, but they don't know the depth of how you got there and presented it to the public. I mean, it's like, I mean, like a hundred years from now, when they look back in Los Angeles of the great of the great artists that came out of Los Angeles, who was great across the board, uh, your name's gonna pop up. And uh, I mean, I mean, your your I mean, the, your record speaks for yourself. So I'm glad to be able to. You know, be able to work with you at any time because you know, when it goes down, you know, it got your back. You know, it's like you, you know, been for me. So, you know, because I remember when uh, during the protest for the uh, for the time at the towers. I mean, that was probably the first time that we kind of got to meet a little bit. Even though I knew you a little, little bit before, but I really didn't know you that time. But I remember Tony and I were and a whole bunch of folks. We had picket signs, and it was on the front. It was in the uh, they took a picture of a, you know, of course, in front of us and in front of the towers. And so that was kind of interesting how going through that period and then going through all the different phases that you had talked about and shared with the audience, I think, was really great, you know, and uh, and to where you are now, like, uh, man, it's, we're in some exciting times. It's hard times, but it's very exciting times. And, and yeah. the two, Thanks, man. Thanks. The two yeah. guys' uh, history goes so back, go far so back, and you have uh, from the picketing for him to uh, yep. Kuumba to Kalei. <laughs> oh, we didn't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, I got over it real quick. That was a That's a fireside chat where we're all sitting around with a nice brew and then we'll be out. I would say about yeah, that particular to time. Over it real quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I, was, I, was, I do agree with the version. I would say that actually. Then because of that period, it was uh, we got together. That's when we first really sat down and talked and got to know each other. And then ever since then, you know, we start, you know, you know, when we come by the house, we, you know, we sit down and chat. And then, you know, we always have these long conversations. Even now, like in our studios, we have these long powwows, you know, and we just like, I mean, we, we sitting there, we think it's five minutes, it's three hours later, you know. And, and it's good for us because that's kind of like, you know, you know, we had to share journey and we had to share commitment. You know, it's not it's not about us only about our art, but it's about like how our art affects our community and stuff and what it means to everybody. And I think that uh and sometimes you gotta like just, you know, kinda of bounce off each other to find out if we do if we if we are connected or not. <laughs> so Well thank you, man. I mean and, and you guys uh, is uh in the same building. 
And, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, That's the place where I love it. And who else, yeah. who, else, who else is in this uh, building? Uh, we had Ed Yule and we had Monisa Whitaker, uh, two fine okay. artists and stuff. And uh, and there's, there's some other ones in the surrounding community, but like, Oh, I guess we lost him. Can you still hear me, Tim? Hello? Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Hello, okay. Michael? Oh, okay, here we go. We got him back. Hello. Oh, you lost me? Yeah, yeah four minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, it was like, you know, uh, you know it was a few of us here at the, at the Warren Lane studio. It was like, there's other artists, but the four of us, we kind of know each other for years, you know, um, Individually, and then also we came together, with, with including you and, and the Ferguson family in regards to the collective art group. You know, and that was the way we organized during that period at the uh, at the beginning of the new millennium. So, uh, yeah, so Inga was in the house. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, my pleasure. So I'll, I'll let you guys get back. Into, I want to hear more good stuff. Uh, I didn't know about that story in Mexico with you and Damon. I want to hear more stuff, so I'll get off now. <laughs> Two balls of Oh, man, I love that. <laughs> okay, you guys have a good one. I'll talk to you all later. Thank okay, you take very care. Much. Thank you. Okay, all right. Um, Bye-bye. We actually have, well, we have um, one more call. Come okay. In. All right. Hello? Hello, caller, are you there? Hello, caller. Caller. I feel like Larry King. Larry King. <laughs> Hello, caller. Hello. Can anybody hear me? Yes, there yeah, we go. Hey, what's hey. up? Hey, what's up, man? This is John Dennis Cecil's grandson. <laughs> I see you all the time, man. Oh, yeah. Now, you know, I just want to say congratulations because, you know, I've been, I've known you all my life. Ever since, you know, I, before I've been staying here with my grandparents, I will always see you, you know, come out of blue, come out of nowhere. And just, you know, looking at your artwork around the house, does some, you do some great stuff, man. And I would actually, you know, like to get to learn everything I could from you just to try to be a better artist myself. So, sure, no problem. No problem at all. Thanks for calling. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. One of these days you have to take me by your studio, though. <laughs> oh, it's all right. Just let me know when, man. It's open, you know. Just let me know. Come by. No problem at all. I mean, yeah, you just from your conversations around the house, you told me just from me listening in, I've learned a lot of stuff I haven't heard before. You know, so, I mean, I've learned stuff from you and just just from a conversation you're not even having with me, just, you know, by listening in. So that's, uh, you know, that's saying a lot right there. And very intelligent person. So oh, someone people should be happy to learn from. And I and I think it'd be better if you you should you know by what I've seen your work, you should be a much popular artist than you are. That's just my opinion, but you know, you know how they do us black folks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, you know, I it's funny understand. though. I I recall one of the many um, mural tours that. I put on, and um, you were very nice, Willie, to come out to Portrait of My People and speak yeah. to the the the, uh, the tourists. The, oh, well, I almost forgot about the tour. I almost and, forgot about uh, that. I don't know if you remember, uh, John was a small child at one of those tours, and I can remember mm-hmm. him taking a picture with you, you know, at this uh, event. And uh, it's one of the memories I have. Of uh, of you throughout the years. Oh yeah. yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, that was that was really a cool event. So. Mhm. Um, it was. I remember it too. I remember it's a long time ago, but I remember, you know, looking up basically how sure I was. I just it was, it was a really long time ago. It was just around. Was this even two thousand? Just old one or something like that? Yeah, it was a while ago. But yeah, a long time like, ago. But hey, that's some that's some good memories right there. Yeah, thanks for calling in, man. That was great. I'm g- really glad you did. Anytime you want to come by, you know, just give me a call. You come over. Yeah, 
I hold Anything you to that. You just let me know. <laughs> Thank you very much, Colin. All right. Okay, take care. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, this, I, I've turned into uh, Larry King. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, I'm sorry, my stories aren't that juicy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like Detroit. <laughs> but uh, once again, I I like to thank you very much for being on our first podcast on Blog Talk Radio. Um, Next week, we're going to have artist Yerne Brown. He's going to come in, and he's going to talk about his his, uh, career. Um, But once again, if you want to check out the show, it's it's, uh, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. The uh, call-in phone number is 347-855-8305. If you want to leave a voicemail that can be played on the show, uh, if you are listening to this um, on iTunes or if you're listening to it through Blog Talk Radio, uh, not live, you can call area code 206-426-3101. That is area code 206-426-3101. And you can leave a voicemail message that we'll play in next week's show. Um, And that next week's show will be artist Yerne Brown uh, as our guest. Um, once again, thank you very much, Willie. Um, oh, thank you for having me. I am I'm honored to, to be here. And uh, that's Art Beat. Until next week, my name is Kente Ferguson. Thank you, and 